In this video, we're going to explore a very important concept in biology, the concept of fitness. Uh, and I'm mainly drawing on a paper by Robert Brandon called uh, Adaptation and Evolutionary Theory. So uh, if you want more detail, go and look at that. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard the famous phrase that's often used as the slogan for evolutionary theory, survival of the fittest. More precisely, we would probably want to say survival and reproduction of the fittest. That's a little more clunky, but that's essentially what biologists have in mind. Um, the better adapted organisms reproduce, the worse adapted fail to reproduce, and this accounts for much evolutionary change in populations. But what does it mean to say that an organism is fitter or better adapted? Well, the obvious answer, and the answer that sometimes seems to be suggested by biologists, is that fitness is a matter of reproductive success. Uh, the fittest organisms are those organisms that uh, produce the most surviving offspring. But then our slogan, survival and reproduction of the fittest, becomes a tautology. And we'd be saying survival and reproduction of those that survive and reproduce. Um, this is, of course, a, a w well known problem. It's sometimes used as a, a sort of gotcha argument by uh, creationists. Um, but is there, you know, is there actually a, a, a problem here? Well, first, it's worth uh, outlining the basic principles of natural selection. Uh, natural selection occurs in a population when three conditions obtain. First, uh, variation. There is, there is variation in the traits of the uh, members of the population. Uh, for example, uh, it, you know, in, in kettle wells moths, some moths are dark, other moths are light. Heredity, uh, some traits are heritable, uh, organisms resemble their parents more than they resemble unrelated individuals. So if two dark coloured moths breed, the, or the offspring will also be dark coloured. Uh, finally, differential reproduction. Uh, since resources are limited, uh, organisms survive and reproduce at different rates. Uh, differential reproduction is, is caused by the differences in heritable variation. Now, reproductive success uh, is simply the actual number of offspring. One organism is more reproductively successful than another if it has more offspring. When we examine the natural world, we find an interesting phenomenon. We find that reproductive success is correlated with certain traits. We find, for example, uh, that the dark-coloured moths have more offspring than the light-coloured moths. Why is this? Uh, well, the answer given by Darwinian theory is because there's a struggle for existence and certain individuals are, in virtue of their traits, fitter or better adapted to their environments than other individuals. We have a, a, a property, fitness or adaptedness to the environment, and this property increases the probability of reproductive success. Uh, in other words, if we ask, you know, why do organisms with trait X have more offspring than those without it, the answer will be that trait X uh, promotes fitness or is, is, is fitter. This uh, theory presupposes a general law which Robert Brandon calls D. And D says that if A is fitter than B in environment E, then probably A will have more offspring in the, uh, than B in E. Um, more technically, actually, we'd, we'd probably want to say uh, it will have uh, a higher number of fertile offspring that survive to sexual maturity, but we'll keep it with this simple formulation. Uh, now, you might want to uh, write this down because we're going to be referring back to, to this law D throughout this video. Um, so, you know, j jot it down so you have that in, in your mind throughout. Uh, anyway, it's pretty clear that if fitness is defined to mean reproductive success, so fitter organisms by definition have more offspring, then D becomes a tautology. Uh, or if we say uh, more weakly that fitter organisms are those which probably will have more offspring, uh, again D becomes a tautology. Why, why does this matter? Well, for one thing, uh, tautologies can't explain anything. Um, you, know, you, you can't explain why John is unmarried by pointing out that he's a bachelor. That's just, you know, tautologies aren't interesting. Um, tautologies aren't falsifiable. Furthermore, we need to allow that reproductive success can be produced by processes other than selection. In contemporary evolutionary theory, uh, an important process is genetic drift. 
Drift can be see, uh, seen as uh, a change in frequencies of alleles due to sampling error. So just as a, a sort of toy example, suppose you have a population of butterflies, 50% of them have got red wings, 50% of them have got green wings, and so far none of them have reproduced. Uh, then some sort of environmental disaster happens, a volcanic eruption or whatever, and most of the butterflies are killed, but there are a few survivors. And just by chance, most of the survivors have red wings. We wouldn't want to say that red wings are fitter than green wings. It's not that red wings uh, somehow confer some sort of advantage uh, in surviving volcanic eruptions. Uh, it's, it's just the green winged butterflies fell victim to bad luck. Um, but in this case, the red winged butterflies uh, will be more reproductively successful. Uh, so. Any, def any, any definition of fitness has to allow us to attribute evolutionary change to processes other than selection, um, because you know, se selection is, is statistical. Um, we're not saying that fitter organisms will always produce more offspring. So, what we want then is a definition of fitness that makes D a respectable scientific law. And Brandon suggests that uh, this imposes four constraints on any acceptable definition of fitness. First, independence. Fitness can't be defined in terms of reproductive success, um, because this would make D a tautology. The property of fitness is something that causes reproductive success. It's, it's something that can explain reproductive success. Uh, so we can't, can't define it in terms of reproductive success. Second, generality. We want D to be a general law that applies to all populations undergoing natural selection. So the definition of fitness has to apply to all species. Recall Kettlewell's moths, where industrial pollution made the trees go black, and so moths with dark wings were better camouflaged, and dark wings spread through the population. The darker coloured moths were fitter. But obviously, we can't define fitness in terms of having a dark colour, uh, because it, you know, it may be true that moths with a dark colour were, were fitter, but that wouldn't be true of many other populations. Uh, D would become inapplicable as a general law. We, we need to find a definition of fitness that applies across the board. Third, applicability. Uh, so basically what this means is that D has to be testable. Um, we, have to, we have to know how we would go about falsifying it. Um, we have to know uh, how D is to be applied in certain cases, which means we have to know, at least in principle, how to tell whether or not one organism is fitter than another. Brandon gives the example that um, some people define fitness in terms of close correlation with the environment. So they would say that A is fitter than B, uh, if and only if A is more closely correlated to its environment than B. But what does close correlation mean? You know, how, how could we ever tell whether one organism is more closely correlated to its environment than another. That, that just seems completely vague. Uh, it's not clear how you'd go about actually testing that. Uh, now, the, the definition of fitness in terms of dark colour meets this condition because we do know what it is for one organism to have a darker colour than other. Similarly, if we define fitness in terms of reproductive success, that also meets this condition because we know what it is for one organism to have more offspring than another. Uh, now, it's important to note, though, that uh, although, it, you know, it, although it has to it has to be testable in principle, but not necessarily in practice. Um, if you define fitness as reproductive success, we know in principle how to measure this. You just count the offspring of the organisms. In practice, that's almost impossible for organisms in the wild. You know, it's, it's very very difficult to apply. But we know what it is in practice. Uh, to, you know, we know how what, what uh, reproductive success success is basically so you know if if we had um all the time in the world and uh, infinite abilities we could we could in principle test it finally empirical correctness the definition of fitness should not be such that d becomes false uh, so when we examine populations and identify the fitter organisms it must turn out that those organisms do on average have more offspring Suppose we were to say that fitter organisms are those that are more intelligent, 
Uh, of course, the concept of intelligence is somewhat controversial. There are various ways of measuring it, but it, it, it seems like in principle we could figure out which organisms are more intelligent than others. But it's pretty clear, just looking at humans, that intelligent people don't tend to have more offspring than unintelligent ones. Um, in fact, I think uh, if you look at some sociological studies, uh, it, 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 at least if you treat uh, education as uh, a kind of proxy for intelligence, uh, people with, with higher levels of education tend to have fewer offspring. Uh, so if fitness just means intelligence, then it seems that D is going to become false. Um, it's false that fitter organisms will have more offspring, and we don't want that. So to summarise then, uh, D needs uh, to tell us something you know, substantial, it can't be a tautology, uh, it must apply to all species, it must be possible to understand, at least in principle, uh, how to test it or how to apply it to particular cases, and it must not be false. These are general requirements that we expect of uh, a scientific law. So this is what we want, but Brandon argues that it cannot be had. Uh, he constructs a general argument to show that no definition of fitness can meet all of these criteria. So uh, before explaining his argument, I'll consider a couple of possible definitions. A popular definition, which is held, for example, by Stephen Jay Gould in his article Darwin's Untimely Burial, is that uh, the fitter organism is the one with superior design in its environment. So uh, D claims that if A has superior design in, than B in environment E, then probably A will have more offspring than B in E. This definition raises the question, what exactly do we mean by superior design? Uh, pretty obviously this is no more, more than a metaphor. Uh, natural selection does not literally design organisms, uh, rather it explains the appearance of design. Uh, but I think the point here is that some traits are superior for living in certain environments. If the temperature drops, the development of a thick coat will help the organism retain heat. If a new predator comes into the area, uh, the development of certain patterns on the coat will help camouflage the organism. We can think of the environment as presenting problems to the organism, and natural selection is the mechanism that solves these problems. The fittest organisms are those that solve the problems best. Un unfortunately, it's very difficult to see how this can be uh, applied in general. How do we tell whether one trait is better at solving a particular problem than another trait? Furthermore, of course, organisms have a variety of different traits that solve different problems, often with trade-offs between different traits. So how do we weigh up uh, all of these uh, you know, different aspects to determine which is the fitter organism overall. Now, of course, what biologists would would actually do to answer these questions is just count the offspring, right? That's how we measure fitness in practice. But superior design is supposed to be something different from reproductive success. Uh, so there must be some other way to identify it, uh, if only in principle. But even in principle, it's not clear you know, how, how, you, how we should weigh up all of the organism's traits to determine which, is, which has the superior design. Uh, in fact, you know, th 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 there are, th th there's kind of a deeper problem here. Um, to say that a design is superior is to make a, a normative judgment. Now this normative claim it looks like it shouldn't really have any place in natural selection. Selection doesn't care whether something is more beautiful or more morally good or whatever. So what do we mean by you know, superior? How should we understand this, this normative claim? Well, we might frame superior design in terms of comfort to the organism. So an organism counts as having superior design just in case it has a more comfortable, enjoyable existence. I mean, that's one thing that might count as superior design, but that obviously can't be right. Why? Because we know that having a more comfortable existence doesn't necessarily increase reproductive success. Uh, in, in fact, a, a more comfortable existence would often decrease reproductive success. The natural world is brutish and cruel, and um, it doesn't really care for the comfort of organisms. Ultimately, then, it looks like what counts as superior design is simply going to be a matter of whatever design, allow, uh, uh, whatever design you know, leaves more descendants. Uh, so we're, we're back at defining fitness in terms of reproductive success. Gould's definition is a metaphor. Uh, 
And when we try to specify what literal meaning the metaphor is hinting at, it seems we have to appeal to reproductive success, rendering D a tautology. Uh, on the other hand, if we leave superior design unanalyzed, uh, well, that violates uh, the third condition. Uh, it becomes untestable. It's, it's too vague to be uh, applicable. Uh, we run into the same problem as the close correlation definition. Brandon considers a definition due to Walter Bock and Gerd von Warlet. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that name correctly, but that's what I'm going with. Uh, Bock and von Warlet uh, try to define fitness in terms of energy requirements. For an organism to survive and reproduce, it must expend energy. But the energy available to any organism is limited. The fitter organisms, then, are those that minimise the amount of energy expended given their ecological niche. So uh, A is fitter than B in environment E if it requires less energy to maintain successfully its niche in that environment than, than B. Obviously, we have to uh, specify the particular niche that the organisms uh, occupy, or we would have to say that you know bacteria, for example, are fitter than humans just because they're uh, a lot smaller, obviously use a lot less energy. So um, you know, we, we, we look at organisms occupying the same niche. Uh, Bock and von Wallet then suggest that we determine the amount of energy expended by measuring the amount of oxygen consumed. Uh, of course, this is problematic for organisms that don't that don't use uh, oxygenic re respiration, but in principle it, it um, could be extended. So for anaerobic respiration, maybe consider the uh, amount of nitrite consumed or whatever. There are various problems with this definition, uh, but I want to focus on Brandon's argument against it. Brandon says, well, suppose I'm breeding flies in the laboratory. Some flies are fitter than others by Bock and von Wallet's criteria in that they expend less energy than others. Then I prevent those flies with the lesser energy requirements from breeding while allowing those with the greater energy requirements to breed. In my, labo in my laboratory, it's not the case that organisms with lesser energy requirements will probably have more offspring. Of course, this is a case of artificial selection, but artificial selection is just one kind of natural selection. If we accept Bock and von Wallet's definition of fitness, uh, then D becomes false. It fails the criterion of empirical correctness, because by their definition, the fitter organisms in my laboratory do not, uh, will not tend to have more offspring. Now, what's important about this argument is Brandon points out that this this same kind of argument can be applied to all definitions that meet uh, our first three criteria. Uh, so definitions of fitness, so that D is, is not a tautology, that D is general, and that D is testable. Any definition meeting those criteria will make D empirically incorrect because we can construct cases of artificial selection that will falsify it. Oddly, Brandon doesn't actually spell out this part of his argument in his paper, but let me try to uh, reconstruct what I think he has in mind. To avoid making D a tautology, we need to define fitness so that fitness and reproductive success come apart. Right? Fitness is some property X conceptually distinct from reproductive success. And for D to be testable, uh, so we're able to tell, te tell uh, at least in principle, whether one organism is fitter than another, we need X to be something that you know, that, that can be identified. We need to be able to tell whether one organism has X to a greater degree than another. But if we've got this, then we can just specify a case where in the laboratory we artificially select those organisms uh, without X. Um, you know, we, we select against X. And this will mean that X uh, d does not promote reproductive success uh, in, in our laboratory. So D will be false. I mean, let's uh, t take another example, Gould's superior design definition. Gould says that the fitter organism is the one with superior design. Now, uh, we need to specify what counts as superior design in such a way that it, it doesn't simply become you know, reproductive success. Uh, superior design is, is some other thing, X. Well, then we select for organisms that don't have X uh, in, in the laboratory. Uh, and this could always be done in principle, if not in practice. So, any definition satisfying uh, conditions 1 to 3 can be falsified by artificial selection. If you resist the falsification, then you're going to either 
include reproductive success in the definition of fitness, which would make DS autology, or you're going to make the definition so vague uh, or, or inapplicable that, that uh, the third condition is violated, D becomes untestable. Now one immediate objection to Brandon's argument is his appeal to artificial selection. And you know, I guess this sort of seems like something of a of a cheat, um, but I uh, agree with Brandon that uh, that this kind of objection is is basically an unjustified prejudice. There's nothing metaphysically special about humans. A scientist's laboratory is just another kind of environment that puts certain selective pressures on the organisms that live in it. Uh, as as Brandon points out, flies with legs on their heads would surely be less fit in the wild, but in the context of a laboratory study of genetic manipulation, where we are specifically breeding flies with legs on their heads, um, they they would surely be the fittest. Um, you know, why should we treat selection by humans any differently from, for example, uh, how birds select against light-coloured moths you know, by eating them, uh, or how uh, bees select for bright-coloured flowers by preferentially pollinating them? In any case, even if we say that artificial selection is fundamentally different from natural selection, it's still, there's still a problem here because it seems that any selective pressure placed on organisms by humans could also be placed on them in a purely natural environment. Now, it, it would be difficult to imagine such cases, but it probably could be done. Um, you know, there are plenty of cases of, of natural selection just as bizarre as artificial selection. Um, so you know, with, with the example of Bock and von Wallet's definition, I'm sure we could imagine uh, a case in a purely natural environment where organisms are selected uh, so that, that they have greater energy requirements. It would be a bizarre case, but um, nature is sometimes bizarre. So uh, this seems to be a bit of a problem. Um, you know, we, we, we had these four conditions that we require of any respectable scientific law, and it looks like uh, D doesn't, doesn't, can't satisfy them all. So what should we do about this? Well, Brandon's suggestion is that we should distinguish D as a uh, schematic law from specific instanti instantiations of D. Now, uh, with this distinction uh, in place, I don't think the precise definition of fitness matters so much but uh, you know just so we know uh, what Brandon's views are he adopts the definition of fitness that a is fitter than b uh, in environment e if and only if a is better able to survive and reproduce in b than b in e uh, this is not a tautology because it's not defined in terms of actual reproductive success you know, by analogy we might say that a car is able to go 150 miles per hour, even though we know it never has and never will actually go that fast. But this definition uh, clearly fails the third criterion. It's not applicable or testable. I mean, how, how could we tell whether something is you know, better able to survive and reproduce in a, in a particular environment? Um, but, you know, Brett Brennan says, well, since uh, my argument shows that no definition of fitness can satisfy all four criteria, it's not really a big deal that this fails one of the criteria. Um, so what we can do with, with this is use this definition to form specific hypotheses about specific populations. So here it is again, here's Brandon's definition of fitness. And what we do is we we use this definition to and, and, and fix uh, the, um, the sort of variables and the parameters. So let's take, for example, Kettlewell's moths. Industrial pollution has caused the trees to go a darker colour, so moths with darker wings are closer to the colour of the trees. Moths that are closer to the colour of the trees are less likely to get eaten by birds and therefore more likely to leave offspring. So what we get is this. Uh, moth A is fitter than moth B in polluted forest X. I mean, obviously we would need to specify the environment in more detail, but you know, this is just an example, so that will do. Uh, moth A is fitter than moth B in polluted forest X, if and only if moth A's wings are darker colored than B's in polluted forest X. Um, and uh, so with, with this then, we can distinguish D as a schematic law from specific instantiations of D. The schematic law is what I introduced at the start of the video.
uh, if A is fitter than B in environment E, then probably A will have more offspring than B in E. And a specific instantiation of D fills in these, these variables. And we say, if moth A is darker winged than moth B in polluted forest X, then probably moth A will have more offspring uh, than moth B in polluted forest X. So, D as a schematic law is not testable. Um, and this instance of D is not general. But this instance of D is testable. Uh, indeed, this particular instantiation has famously been tested. That was you know, what, what Kettlewell was, was testing. So the thought is then that in stating the schematic law, we give up testability. But when we instantiate the schematic law with a particular example, we, we have a testable explanatory hypothesis, but it isn't general. So in, in both cases, we're sort of giving up one of the... Uh, Criteria. In the first case, we're giving up um, testability, uh, but it, when we instantiate the schematic law, we're giving up gen generality. Now, this view has some uh, interesting consequences. Earlier in the video, I said that fitness is a property that causes reproductive success. Brandon doesn't uh, discuss this point, but it seems to me that he takes a kind of deflationary view of fitness, uh, where it's, it's, it's actually not a, a real property. D is more like a tool for generating hypotheses about what it takes for members of specific populations to survive and reproduce in specific environments. Um, there isn't some general property of fitness that organisms either have or lack. Uh, so we might compare this, if you're familiar with theories of truth, to a, a kind of deflationary view of, of truth. This seems to be like a deflationary view of, of fitness, where it treats D more as a, a tool than as uh, telling us about actual properties in the world. A uh, second consequence is that a uh, fundamental law of evolutionary theory cannot even in principle be falsified. No matter how many instances of D are falsified, we cannot falsify the schematic law. So take the moth example. If experiments had disconfirmed our instantiation of D, you know, if we'd found that darker winged moths had less offspring, we would simply assume that we hadn't analysed the ecological situation correctly. And then we would come up with uh, some other instantiation. So we might think, for example, maybe the birds prey on moths using heat sensing, so colour variation is irrelevant to that. And that would give us a new instantiation of D. If that is also falsified, again, we'd assume that, that we hadn't analysed the situation correctly, and we'd go on to create new ones, uh, new hypotheses. So just as a, a sort of logical matter, no number of falsifications of the instances of D could falsify the general schematic law. At, at worst, we might decide that D isn't useful. It's not a useful principle for organising research, but we could never falsify it. Um, and so that seems uh, like quite an interesting consequence. One question that we might raise, uh, though, is, I mean, is, is D so different from other scientific laws in this respect. Could we falsify Newton's laws, you know, like force equals mass times acceleration, by, by instances? When we use Newtonian mechanics to make predictions, we have, uh, we have to specify in detail the initial conditions. We can use Newtonian mechanics to make predictions about the orbits of a planet, um, and we have to plug in the masses of each planet and you know, the mass of the sun and the orbit of each planet and so on. Uh, and this is something that astronomers have done over the last few hundred years. But we've often found that the observed orbits did not match the predicted orbits. For example, after Herschel discovered Uranus, it was found that Uranus didn't seem to fit the predictions of Newtonian mechanics. But that was not taken to falsify Newton's laws. Instead, scientists simply assumed that they hadn't analysed the situation properly. In the case of Uranus, it was assumed that there must be another planet further out that was influencing Uranus's orbit. And that, of course, was discovered, and it's called Neptune. Similarly, Mercury's orbit diverged slightly from the Newtonian predictions. Again, this wasn't taken to falsify Newton's laws. Instead, it was assumed there must be another planet, or perhaps a group of asteroids, closer to the Sun. What falsified Newtonian mechanics was not some specific failed prediction. Rather, various problems from various fields built up. Uh, they didn't surrender to the standard patterns of analysis. These problems might not have seemed related. There doesn't initially seem to be any relation between the you know, null result of the michelson morley experiment and the discrepancies in Mercury's orbit. But general relativity solved both those problems.
Anyway, uh, the point is that Newton's laws are arguably similar to D. Uh, we don't test the laws themselves, rather we test particular applications of the laws to specific situations. Uh, and it's not that the laws are ever falsified, uh, rather eventually problems build up and we come to see the laws as less useful. I mean, that's one view we might take of scientific laws in general, in which case um, there's nothing particularly unusual uh, about the fact that D is, is not falsifiable, only specific instances of D are falsifiable. Um, but that's uh, you know so something to, to think about there. Anyway, that's all I wanted to talk about in this video. I hope you found it interesting, and um, I'll see you next time. Goodbye.